So good afternoon, everybody, and um, welcome to this, the latest in the series of ASFP webinars. Today, we are talking about uh, the passive fire protection for enforcement authorities. Uh, my name is Andrew Taylor. For those of you that don't may know me, I'm the technical officer here at ASFP. Um, we'll do what we normally do, which is we'll just wait for a few moments more to let people join the, the webinar, and then we'll get going. Um, OK, I apologise for the fact that originally this was slated as a as a two hour event with a round table, but unfortunately, uh, due to various circumstances, we've had to cancel the round table element. Um, but we'll still do we'll do what we normally do with our ASFP webinars and we'll do a, a presentation and a, a Q&A series at the end of it. Okay, looking at that, the number of attendees has, has seems to have, have plateaued off and attend and, and whatever. So we shall make a start. So good afternoon, everybody. Uh, here we go. So I, it, unfortunately for you today, that there's, there's due to various circumstances, there's me and my voice for the next hour. Um, and hopefully you could be able to put up with that as we go. So welcome to the webinar. Today, we're going to talk to you about, as we say, about passive fire protection in terms of enforcement. Um, please, if we're going to let's hopefully we've got time to some, take some questions at the end. So please, you've got a, a Zoom has a question and answer facility. And if you would use that, that's fine. There is a chat box and I'll, I'll keep a little bit of an eye on that as we go through. And as ever, we've got four polls to, to sense what you're thinking out there in, in the world, the audience world. Um, I've got a slide on the ASFP webinar programme, then we get into the meat of it and 60 slides of presentation. A quick question and answer at the end of it, uh, it says it's addressed by the panel, but the panel today I'm afraid is me, and then we'll sum up and close at the end. Right. So here we are today, we've been doing one of these pretty much every month thus far. Today we're on PFP for enforcement authorities. We're going to do one in October on, on PFP for modern methods of construction is the next one. And then on the 20th of October, we're also going to be doing a member update for ASFP members, where we'll do a little bit on, on all of the things that ASFP have been doing of late, what we've been doing and how we've been developing stuff for our members. And also we'll probably do a, a, a regulatory update because things are changing all the time, as you all well know. And in that subject, that's what I'm going to do today. I'll give you a quick regulatory update in terms of what's new. And we're talking there in terms of enforcement authorities. Um, there's a bit and piece, there's some in there in construction products regulations, because we'd hope to have someone joining us from um, OPSS, who will be the new construction products regulator going forwards. We'll talk a bit about safety cases for high risk residential buildings. And then the meat of the presentation is what about non high risk? residential buildings what about and we talk about everything that comes under cyst under the the requirements of the regulatory reform fire safety order okay so that brings me nicely and neatly to poll question one and somewhere in in back office I've, we've got uh, our georgina who's going to launch that for us and so poll question one says what is your interest in passive fire protection for enforcement authorities and it's a single choice. I'll let you have a think about that for a few seconds. Here we go. So an awful lot of fire uh, of, of inspectors, um, 26%, but the bulk of you is there, but it's sort of spread across from architects, designers, specifiers, manufacturers. It's a right cross mix of you. Excellent. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. Hope this is all of, of some interest and, and whatever, because as if you're from certain areas, this, some of this is new to you and some of this you will have seen before, including this one. So why do we need passive fire protection? Well, our legislation's aimed at protecting life, not necessarily property. 
Um, I'm sure you all recognize the, if, if you've been on these webinars, you'll recognize these pictures. So the picture on the left is Lacanal House, a uh, fire in 2008 that unfortunately killed six people tragically. Um, and one of the mitigate, one of the, the factors that caused the fire to spread in Lacanal House was missing passive fire protection, missing compartmentation. If we compare that to the, the picture in the center and the picture in the right, um, I'm sure that if I said to turn around to you and said, how many of you have heard of Cleveland Tower? Um, those of you who've seen one of my webinars before will know, will have heard of Cleveland Tower because I use it as an example. Cleveland Tower was a 33 story tower block just north of Birmingham, had a fire in a room uh, two weeks after Grenfell. And the reason that you, you don't get hurt, you haven't heard of it and it doesn't reach the public consciousness the same is because the fire was contained into the, the compartment of origin. Fire rescue went in, put the fire out, and it, it was not a significant incident. And so we have a series of, of building regulations. Um, and the text there on the right of this slide is that taken from the actual building, the law that underpins the building regulations. If you look in ADB, it's the text that's in the green boxes. And in terms of internal fire spread and the structure of the building, then provision B3 tells you that you need to make sure that the building is going to survive and maintain its stability in the event of a fire for a reasonable period. And further down there, it, it says that you need to make sure you also want to in, inhibit the spread of fire by using subdivision of the building with fire resisting construction. OK, so and the idea there is you may keep the building structurally stable. You have the compartmentation that in is, is sufficient to, and to to keep the fire contained. Therefore, you enable escape for people that are immediately affected and the fire and rescue services have time to come and do what they need to do and stop the fire from uh, growing and getting out of control. Here's a, a, another example. This is this is a more recent one, Solly Hall. Um, you know, there's a there's a, a tower in a, a, a fire in a high rise tower in December last year. And if you actually look at the fire statistics, in the 12 in a 12 month period from 2019 to 2020 there were over seven and a half thousand fires involving the fire and rescue services that occurred in the uk in purpose-built blocks sorry in england in purpose-built blocks of flats but of those seven and a half thousand own only 16 of them necessitated evacuation of more than five people with the assistance of fire and rescue service so if we keep the fire contained it's a much smaller incident for the fire and rescue services to have to handle. Right. That's why we what that's why we do what we do. So let's consider a, a brief legislative update. He says, and of course, many of you will will recognize the document there in front of you, the May 2018 uh, document published by Dame Judith Hackett, Building a Safer Future. And she made 53 recommendations of how we could improve what we do with, in terms of um, fire safety uh, post Grenfell. So 53 recommendations. Government took that and said, yes, we're going to take all of these 53 recommendations and implement them. And there are a couple of pieces, there are a couple of things the government is doing going forwards um, to do that. And we're still doing this. So, the first one that they had was the fire safety bill and the fire safety bill is a pass through parliament uh, just before easter it's now the fire safety act although we haven't got a date yet when those provisions go live and um, key really key provisions in there is the inclusion of both flat front doors and the external walls into uh, fire in, in, into the con the, the uh, scope of the regulator reform fire safety order. So flat front doors and external wall systems are now deemed common parts of a building. Okay, so that's we wait for to find the the days when when that will, those go live. Next, we've got the building safety bill, and there are two key aspects in there. Um, Within the building safety bill, there's greater scrutiny of construction products. And I've got two, I've got three or four slides on that, which are going to come up next. 
And then thereafter, we're going to look at the regulatory regime for high risk residential buildings. All right. And I just specify that HRRBs, high risk residential building. At the moment, risk is, is, is equates to high rise, but the, 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 the first R is definitely risk in there. OK, we'll talk a bit about the new regulator HSE um, and the H one of the HSE things is to promote competence of those working on all buildings, not just buildings in scope. But new construction products regulation. So one of the one of our concerns at the moment is with the building safety bills going through um, it, the, there's a thing right at the very, very end. The last schedule in there is the construction products bit. Um, it, it starts off with the Secretary of State may by regulations make provision. We still expect that the Secretary of State will want to. This is a key area. Um, but the Building Safety Bill is an enabling legislation to let this happen. Um, and it still makes regulations in there and it's still got all the provisions in there about safety critical product. OK. So one of the concerns we have is that, that with this is that the Secretary of State is given um, lots of powers to make regulation. What we don't know at this stage is what he's going to do with them and what the secondary reg legislation, the regulations will look like. And of course, since I wrote this slide and I did this, we now have a new Secretary of State that's going to be responsible for all this. It was Mr. Jenrick, it's now Mr. Gove. So again, whether that makes a, a substantial difference to where all any of this goes, who knows. But Here's something that's new that's come out in the recent draft. Um, the regulations for us are going to, for, for construction products, are going to be um, underpinned, first and foremost, by a general duty of safety. OK, there's a piece of um, legislation in there um, that, um, that 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 exists already for consumer products in terms of the, the uh, general duty of safety, and that's being extended, expanded to cover construction. Um, BSI are already drafting a new code of practice to bring safe products onto the market. That's PAS 7050. However, as, say, as we say, the secondary of state gets lots of powers to make regulations, but most of that secondary stuff is still missing. Okay. Um, and one of the key things that's in, in there at the moment is, is that there will be a provision for safety critical products to have a, to need a new family of designated product standards. Uh, but we think they're probably going to have to come from EU or internationally, uh, internationally available standards and BS on their own will not be good enough. There's, that all gets very, very tricky. But, but Government's previously committed to reviewing product testing and Paul Morell was revealed as chair and has been doing this since summer. Um, and as a number of ASFP members have met Paul Morell, uh, he's asked a couple of questions of us on a number of occasions. Can we explain product how product testing works in our market? Yes, we can. And is the party certification the answer? Well, we firmly believe it is. Um, I'm led to believe that the report is to be, his his report on all this is to be published in the autumn. Um, that was that's come out from MHCLG or whatever they call themselves this week after they've been rebranded, and um, we're waiting to see that. I'm told that that report is now with the government and they're reviewing it before they publish it. Okay. The bill itself, the building safety bill, is going through what's called public bill committee review. And you can, uh, there's been some sessions of that that if you were really interested, you could dial into Parliament TV and watch. Um, our main concern with the bill as it stands at the moment is the fact that the time, what's the time scale and what's the scope of the secondary legislation and what does it look like? Because how can we assess how, how well the bill is going to? is going to be is going to be if we don't know how they're going to if we don't know how the government's going to use it and 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 what we're told is that we were told on one side that the secondary legislation will come out during the public bill committee review so that we could review it and comment up upon that accordingly but that public bill committee is due to finish by mid-october 
And equally, this government has said that the secondary legislation will come after the Morell report, and the Morell report will probably is probably not going to come until after the conclusion of the Public Bill Committee. So we, how do we, we don't know how, how we deal with this. Okay, and that's a, that's a major concern that we have, that without seeing the, the secondary legislation, how, how effective is it going to be? And of course, so we know that that we've seen with it, I've seen, he said, because I was sad enough to go and watch some of those uh, evidence sessions that there have been, that both Construction Products Association and the Construction Industry Council have been invited, have taken part in the Public Bill Committee evidence hearings. And I did see some of them lobbying for mandatory third party certification of products, uh, but that would need to be done underpinned by an appropriate level of attestation and verification of constancy of performance. And to be honest, that remains our way regarding the way forwards of what we would like to see for products going forwards. And of course, that brings me to my nicely to my usual slide on why we need third party certification of products. Um, I know I'm going early with this one for once, but you know there are three ways that we can demonstrate our products are fit for purpose. We can write it up ourselves, self-declaration. You could use a, a third-party test report, or you could use the, the full-blown third certification. And of course, if we declare for our, our performance for ourselves, there's no guarantee that products have reached the correct standards. I could just be making it up, especially if I say it was designed, it was designed to, or it complies with the test method. How do you know if it was you know, designed to? You can't design you design something to comply with a test method. It doesn't necessarily mean it's being tested. Was it has it been tested? Was the test impartial? And therefore, there is a level of risk there. In terms of a third party test report, a third party test report is a snapshot in performance. All right. Some people take a test report and say it's a certificate when it isn't. It's purely a snapshot in performance. And so is the test sample that you've got at representative of what you buy off the shelves today? Or was it a, 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 a souped up standard? Was it constructed in a special way? And if there's been change, subsequent changes to the design, to raw materials or whatever, who knows? There's a, it's uncertain. There is, again, there's a level of risk. But third party certification, if it's done properly, not only demonstrates the product conformity, but we also should come in complete with a, an audit of the company's production, the company's pro end products. And therefore, as a result, we ensure that the product supplied is the same specification and design as that tested. And so as a result, that's the only route to confidence. OK, that's the quick canter through construction product stuff. Right, let's move on quickly now to the building safety bill and the regulator and our new national building safety regulator under the auspices of HSE is up and running as an interim. Um, and you can get more information on that from the HSE's website and they publish regular updates on stuff uh, in terms of how they're developing guidance for building safety. So go and have a look at that. And we wait and see how, how they're going to unfold. Um, so we know that we, we know they're in there. We know that there's a second piece of secondary legislation imminent because we've seen an amendment, a slight amendment of the definition of high risk buildings Although it's currently sat at 18 metres or seven storeys, the government is still considering this risk-based approach. And the regulator is continuing to on-develop the gateways as identified by Judith Hackett, both through construction process and then ongoing thereafter for high-risk buildings. And the Hackett gateways look something like this. So in design, we have a gateway one where we, we've got to consider fire before we even start to pl plan. Uh, we have a gateway two, which is okay. So we, we know we get permission to, to, to design it and we have to produce detailed plans. At the end of gateway two, we get permission to construct. Gateway three is at the end of, at the end of construction is permission to occupy. Uh, that then leads to a building care certificate and the ongoing management of that building is done by virtue of a safety case. And the underpinning data that flows through that whole process 
it's called the golden thread okay so so at gateway one in terms of hse has already gone live so if you want to build what it would currently class as a high risk residential building you have to get involved with hse already before you get to get permission to planning permission and permission to design and detail do detailed design to consider show that you considered fire as early as that okay beyond that the hackett process um the hackett process is there's a bit more information into it there so planning permission phase gateway one we said has already gone live uh includes a fire safety statement and has to get hse approval before you get permission to design that comes complete with full plans and then look at what's all that there's some stuff there that's in meant to be in the safety case file a digital record of what you've built a control plan a resident strategy an engagement strategy and, and there's various bits and pieces in there okay and in actual fact okay as we said safety case safety we, we we've we've mentioned safety cases on a number of occasions previously um, but we hadn't got very much to, to talk about. HSE gave us this, this sentence here that's in bold, can you identify building safety risks in your building as the what was going to underpin their safety case um, requirements. However, in the last week, 10 days, they've started to, they've now published the first documents. It's a, 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 a a principal document it's an early key message document so it gives you some um it gives you some information as to what you should be looking at if you're involved in drawing up safety cases if you're involved in reviewing safety cases there's that this is the start of a 10 that that sort of gets you gets you in on the way you know what should be in a in a safety case and you've got a series of things listed on the screen in front of you there in terms of what the building is, what hazards are in the building and how you plan to control, manage, control and mitigate them. OK, um, and or what checks and measures you put in place for your maintenance and what checks and measures you put in place to review them. And so the government's hoping and the HSC is hoping that by having this, you're producing um, something that is going to give your occupants, your residents, com safe confidence in the safety that they have in that building. Okay. There's a bit more detail of, of how to achieve this in terms of, you know, thinking about incidents, both from a fire sp spread and structural failure, what could cause them and what would happen if they, if, if they had those incidences. What PFP measures would you can you put in place to prevent escalation of the fire? We've already talked at the very, very start about how that would, you know, what PFP is meant to try to do and contain the fire and keep it small. Um, how do you know that those the PFP measures you have in place will work and are they enough? Uh, how did you choose those PFP measures and are the management systems appropriate? Do they consider changes to the building as you go along? Okay, and a final key message in terms of safety cases, uh, as you would have expected, because it's what it's one of Dame Judith's standard mantras that she's been quoting as we go through, is don't wait for legislation. You know, you can start to prepare for some of this now. You already know how your building is used. You you, you can consider how systems are interact. You, you ought to be able to work out which elements and which components are safety critical and those are important things that you need to consider as you as you as we go through okay so that takes us nicely and neatly to poll question two please georgina so have you started work on your safety cases yet and it's a single choice
So half of you are lucky that you aren't responsible for any high risk residential buildings. That's fine. Um, and it said, interestingly, 17% of you have already started collating information on, on safety cases. So if we assume half aren't, so that's uh, half aren't responsible, we can double up the others. 34% of you who have HRRBs have started work on it, but 44% of you are waiting for the bill to be finalised and, and more clarity. Um, so, I, I, well, I, that's an interesting, that's an interesting uh, position to be in. I, I would suggest that, as we said on that previous slide, there's some stuff you can already do to get ready. Right. OK. What about non high rise residential? No, sorry, non high rise. See, I even I do it. Non high risk residential buildings. Right. So regulation 38 still applies for buildings in scope of the regulator reform fire safety order. And that's virtually every building except private dwellings. OK, and tucked away at the back of ADB in both parts, there's a couple of pages on fire safety information. Um, there's a series of requirements that at the completion of any uh, of any building or extension or modification, this information should be given by whoever by the by the people who can undertaken the work to the responsible person for that building and it's all sorts of things like the location of fire separating elements uh, for more complicated complex buildings um, the information on all passive fire safety measures and because that data is going to be needed to be considered within the ongoing fire risk assessment needed by regulatory reform fire safety order okay and basically, if you think about it, the, the two almost become become hand hand in glove because regulation 38 and the more detailed information you have on your regulation 38 side, then then the, the it, that that will help the fire risk assessor do the, the fire risk assessment. OK, with with the four types of fire risk assessment in that little box there at the bottom, looking at the common parts of the building, not invasively invasively or or going into the uh, not only doing common parts but going into individual flats non-invasive and invasive depends whatever and and if so for instance if if you were able to provide your fire risk assessor with a, a series of pictures a series of evidence that yeah here's my fire stopping i've got id references that can be tied back to install records and product certification and install the certification then then basically um, type one risk assessments should be sufficient. Um, and you should be able to just look, go look and hey, jobs are good and we know what we're we know what we're dealing with. OK. So if it's only then really in those cases that if you then get to, well, I've, I've looked and what I was expecting to see and what the records show I was should be seeing was not what I was seeing that you may want to get into type two. And, and one of the big challenges for invasive type two type um, risk assessments is is that that you, you're going to be smashing things up. You're going to need someone to repair it as you go along. So it gets an awful lot trickier to do. But so the more records you've got to start, and that's, there's going to be a common theme that goes through the the rest of this as we go through. The more records you've got, the better. Right. What needs to be done? Um, so for modern buildings, basically. If we're looking at our risk assessment, you know, from a regulatory standpoint, doing fire risk assessment and, and getting all that done for it, then the responsible person should have a building layout. Um, and then from from old buildings from 2007 onwards, old, from stock from 2007 onwards, we should have we should be done in compliance with regulation 38. And if and if we can check that the buildings are correct against the regulation 38 and information, all well and good. We know what we, we know it's supposed to have. We can see where we checked it. it. It's the same. It's all dead. It's it's nice and easy. OK, so there you go. There is a bit of a, a, of a challenge for, for doing fire risk assessments in older buildings because the information may not be readily available. Um, so there's probably you're going to have to go into this into a lot more detail to, to conduct that. Um, but, let, you know, start by creating a document that lists all that. And, and, and so that we can check the PFP as part of that fire risk assessment process. And as part of the 
uh, the, the fire risk assessment process. These are a series of check things that you would need to check um, because that's the important, those are the important things. Because the fire risk assessment process is looking at predominantly escape routes. You know, it's we're talking about we're talking about life safety and we're talking about in the event of a fire, can you get out first and foremost? And so it's looking at the common parts of buildings. It's looking at escape routes. And if you look at that, a lot of that is is aimed at the escape routes um, and the common part first and foremost. OK. And so you can see there all the different things that you would need to check. The interesting one there is that there isn't necessarily a detailed inspection under fire risk assessment of the structural fire protection. Um, but it, it, unless it's freely available and you can see it whilst you're examining other things. OK, so that brings me nicely and neatly to poll question three. And poll question three, which I'm hoping is going to appear on the screen in front of us. Have you heard of Regulation 38? Um, so there you go. Have you heard of Regulation 38? And what do you know about it? And I'll leave you a few moments to, um, to consider that. So I'm just going to reach over here. So, yeah, and, and that's that's a really interesting response. Um, the vast majority have heard of, of, of Regulation 38, only 14, oh, oh well, 17% of you have said that this is the first time you've heard about it, and 14% of you have said, no, you haven't. So 31% uh, of you could have, uh, haven't heard of this, but this has been around, 38's been around since 2007, and before 2007, I think it was 16B, to give it another, its other name. Um, but the interesting thing, I would agree that in a lot of instances, records could be a lot better. Um, and it does make life very, very hard when you look trying to work out whether something is correct, that, that we've got poor records of what's actually been designed and, in, and constructed and installed. And as a result, you're left scratching your head thinking, how on earth? And this was one of the things that came up in the maintenance uh, session we did a few months back. OK. Right, so he says, let's consider this. How do you inspect this? He says, and you know, the easy way to, one of the most important things to do is to look into all, into all the difficult to get to bits. And there's a, there's a, there's a picture there of a, of, a, of, a, of, a, of a remote video camera for looking inside of walls and whatever. I mean, I'll be honest with you, it, it, that's quite an old piece of kit. This is this is my piece of kit that I have. He says, hold, trying to hold it up. Um, it was twenty quid from Amazon, and it's uh, it's got a fun little lens that you can put into the compartment walls, and it uh, pictures now appear on your your screen. So, um, so that's so the you know the remote use of remote camera and video equipment. You can get them fairly cheap nowadays. Okay. Um, look, you, so get in there, get in behind the, the, the walls above the false ceilings because you never know what you're going to find and check the status of what's up there, including fire stopping and, and record it with record the findings. My classic example of this went to a, a, a site and do a site inspection at a university contractor had been up and down this corridor so many a couple of months before and everything was meant to be good and it was all it was all done. Um, you know, with, with, the, with the app recorded, this is how we did it, this is what we did, this is the certification that underpins it, everything had a little label there with the contractor's name, a seal number, a QR code, it was all nice and bonny. And in the intervening period since the contractor had been through there, telecoms engineer had come through, run a category five tech cable underneath the, uh, above the false ceiling, through the, through the um, compartment wall, above the fire door, smashed a hole in either side with a, with a claw hammer and stuffed the pipe and stuffed the cable through. And so you've got all this lovely fire stopping and a big hole in the wall next to to it okay <clears throat> so so you know you that's that and and basically you, the assessor needs to know enough to know that something is wrong and 
beyond that, if you if when you when you're as an enforcement authority you're looking, you see something's wrong, then that's fine. You know, report that whatever is wrong is wrong, uh, uh, and obviously, ex if you've got worries, get an expert in because passive fire protection, as we say, is a complicated. Is a, as we've said on a number of occasions, a complicated subject, and there are experts that can come in and tell you, yes, that's right, no, that's wrong, etc. A uh, couple of things, not necessarily um, PFP to consider. So walls and ceilings, linings, um, and this is more of a reaction to fire issue. So you know, we you've got to watch out for extensive overpainting because paint systems, if they're thick and poorly adhered can be co cause problems with becoming flammable and certainly in escape routes you should keep them you, you should keep you know make sure that you know what the reaction to fire performance of your wall system is and of course keep them clear of of furniture and other stuff um it does a, a a word of warning uh, uh, you know materials added to surfaces such as very nice little tapestry there in a in a fire escape corridor um, you know, significant, you know, what about carpets, posters, notices, etc. Significant amounts of these things should probably be removed. It's a bit of a management issue, but with a, with a caveat that fab, some fabrics can be treated with flame retardants to um, improve their reaction to fire performance. But what evidence have you got? What information have you got about that going forward? You know, bear in mind that extensive overpainting and, and flammable surfaces has been responsible for several fire incidents you know most probably most notably king's cross uh, in 1987 okay fire doors is very important because of course fire um because we, we're looking primarily here within fire risk assessment world in escape routes fire doors tend to be on escape routes so look at all of them uh, is it a fire door um, are, there, are there the correct labels and plugs for certifications? There's a little slide on that comes at the end. Um, what are the gaps around the edges? Around about three mil is the, the, the normal rule. Um, has the frame been fixed and sealed? Uh, is the iron mongery right? You know, fire doors come with three hinges. Does the operation of any lock, latch, striker, at whatever at work, presence of any self-closing device, and does that work? And is that work in accordance with all the standards? Um, so there's a whole there's a whole series of good things. You know, we we've got a if, if you look at this the, the picture on the screen here, we've got one hinge. Hopefully we've got three. There are the quality plugs that we see in the in the in the door leaf, and you've got the intermessent strips. And the intermessent strips include, you know, how do they treat the the iron mongery? They aren't just they aren't just behind the iron mongery. They're also out there as well. How does the glazing look? And is there, is there any intermittent sealing around the glazing? So lots of good things in that picture. Unlike these pictures, where there's lots of bad things. Um, we've got a void. We've got some stuff been taken out of the the out of the door here. So obviously, when that door is 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 shut, there's going to be a gap there. Um, you know, here we've got an architrave that's got unprotected. It's got foam in there. Well, is that has that foam been tested? Some manufacturers are now getting these foams tested for um, for the back of door frame, and there is a new test method that covers the back of door frame. So, so that not necessarily, but that's that doesn't look like it's been it's been thought about and planned and done properly, does it? And then, of course, broken hinges and generally poor condition doors. So, so it's always worth look there and, and the other thing to do is to whip some of the if necessary whips if you're unsure about what's involved then whip some of the architrave off and have a look okay um intermescent strips as part of the fire doors very important around the periphery um and then is there a smoke seal or not um and what can happen with some smoke seals is they get painted over and so they don't do what they're supposed to do anyway um and is there a hold open device with automatic release and is that on activation of fire alarm or on on, de on detection uh, and how is it all linked um so you know and what records have you got of the fact that all these doors have been checked both from all that point of view from their closing and and, and etc um and panic you know panic exit devices they aren't necessarily pfp but it's important in escape 
and just as a word of caution, they might be fitted on non-fire doors as well. So that's that. Uh, air transfer grills, are they thermally activated or not? Can they, have they been linked? If they're not thermally activated, have been linked to the fire detection and the fire alarm in escape routes, records of checks, and then third party certificated products installers, you know, look for the quality records. And with all of these things, as we go through, what records have you got? What records have been kept? to show that what was done, to show that what you're looking at, what's been installed is, is correct and right. And it does become, this is going to become a real key thing for everyone going forwards, is the getting better at keeping records, okay? So beyond that, don't assume that existing construction is, is okay with what, if you're looking at walls and floors, again, what records have you got? Um, what does the what what fire resistance is your false suspended ceiling meant to be providing? Is it supposed to be providing any, or is it just purely decorative? Um, what's the fire resistance performance of the glazing system? You know, uh, is if that's an escape route? You know, there's lots and lots of things, and don't just necessarily look at what you're looking at. In, in the picture, but get behind the false ceilings, get behind, get and have a look because you might find some of these horrors, um, you know, on, behind the false ceiling, the petitions hadn't been finished all the way to the, to the top. So there was a nice gap behind there for fire to, to go through and or behind the, behind the false ceiling, there was a nice hole in the floor above, in the floor above um, protected by some of that fire resistant plywood. So, um, you know, you need to do, you definitely need to inspect into some of these hidden places. Okay. And you need to have a look at those. In terms of penetrating services, obviously pipes and cables and the likes go through walls. Have they been suitably fire stopped? Are they in good condition? Is they suitably supported? Have we got labels, uh, were they third party certificated products and were they installed by third party certified installers and we've got labels, what records have we got? Um, there is a, a, a sort of an element of if they're installed properly and they look, they look reasonable, then every, you've got most chance of them being reasonable. Of course, they're all, these are not neat, complete, there's no holes, they're all properly labeled. And if you've got the appropriate records that shows what's been done, then chances are these are okay. Um, you don't need necessarily to, to work out that these aren't necessarily okay, where we've got pipes and cables. I mean, the, the bottom left, we've got no fire stopping whatsoever. And top right, we've there, we've got the infamous PU foam as a floor, um, which is a, you know in a, in a riser cupboard that's probably got around about six or seven minutes worth of fire protection at most, if that. So, sorry, not suitable in that seal at all, okay? However, if you get something like this, then, you know, labels, all the right records, nice, neat job, super. And in terms of that, sfp has got a document out there, uh, TGD 17, which gives you a code of practice for, installing and inspecting fire stopping systems in buildings and within that document there's a there's some checklists and a series of um, template reform forms templates etc and there's a there's a big table in there which helps you explain you know just just how much of this should we inspect as we can as we uh, go through the installation at handover and then what should we inspect as part of other building work and annually as part of your regulatory reform uh, fire risk assessment. Okay, so basically, you know, from the point of view of building owner, responsible person, please let's you know, try and keep for records from your third party certified installer, get records of how it was constructed, what products were used, the certification of the product, certification of the installer, and tie all that back maybe to a location of the seal with a possible, you know, with a sticker, a label and a QR code. And if you can get a phone app that shows how this was all installed and the, and the pictures of, of, of the whole thing being done piece by piece, all the better. 
Penetrating services, ducts and dampers, we, we, we come on to ducts and dampers. And again, there's a lot of this the same, same because ducts and dampers, it, this is compartmentation. However, it's compartmentation um, for, uh, it's compartmentation for in terms of um, stopping the air transfer system from becoming the way of, uh, of, of, of the problem with, with the fire. Um, and the, you ask yourself serious questions like, is it suitably fire stopped? Is it suitably supported? Uh, which of the four methods of um, BS9999 do we use? Um, and, uh, the, you know, again, was it third party certificated products, third party installer? Is there a label? And of course, we come back to what records, what records? So we apologize if I'm, if I'm, banging on and over trap but i'm trying to overemphasize this point that, that that this is going to become key going forwards and all that it, what i would say is, is you have to remember that that from a fire risk assessment point of view in terms of that then that's with we're looking at ducts and dampers that serve escape routes um not all ducts and dampers but it's how they go through and the that's the examples that we get within um bs double 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 nine double nine and that is um, that's also contained within the blue book. So if you want to get some, you know, get some more information on that, have a look at that. But you can see what we are talking about is a protected stairways and protected lobbies within that particular, um, within those particular examples. Right, and that brings me, and I'm, I'm going to use a new method here. This brings me to poll question four. And I'm going to, I'm going to just, before we call the poll up, I'm just going to say to you, have a look at that picture because poll question four is going to be what's wrong with that picture so just have a think about all the things that could be wrong with that picture okay all right and so go on georgina could you please um uh, bring up the uh, the question now because everyone should hopefully have had a chance to have a look at it for long enough I don't know whether that's covering the what that's covering now on your screen. Uh, fortunately for me, it's on a completely different screen. So what's wrong in this image? And I've given you a series of thoughts. And it says single choice and it shouldn't be single choice. It should have been, sorry, it should be any choice. That'll make something interesting. And so, so I apologize for all of you because in actual fact, he says, you, 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 some of you said the dampers are not in the plane of the wall, they're not, correct. Ducts not protected, mm, one of them isn't, correct. There's no fire stopping around the ducts, There's certainly the fire you know, and, and, and no stop, fire stopping around the dampers. Um, duct performance, of it, no, the, in fact, if you go on, if you close that one down, Georgina, um, it, it was a single choice and it shouldn't have been because in actual fact, he says, all of those things were wrong with that picture. OK, um, and now what we don't know is whether there's whether the, the, the fire resisting wall, the fire resisting petition was then going to come up and pass over and pass round um, that or whether there's going to be a fire resisting ceiling inserted or what. But in actual fact, all of those things are wrong. There's no point in having those dampers there. They're not in the plane of a wall. They're not attached to anything. The ducts are not protected. There's no fire stopping. There's, you know, has the duct performance been evaluated in a cellular beam? Has the cellular beam been evaluated with a duct passing through it? Um, there's no labels, no records. And that's one of those really complicated position. Um, that's one of those really complicated positions. Uh, where you've got multiple things coming together that have been tested in multiple ways, um, it needs considering. Okay, so from a, a duct and damper point of view, um, TGD 18 is our code of practice document for the installation and inspection of duct systems. And again, it's got a, pro a proportion and frequency table similar to fire stopping. 
the, the fire stopping guide that we just put up a few minutes ago um, recommends visual inspection or a leakage test as well. And the leakage test is probably best done as per Beza D143. But remember, when you're looking at duct and damper systems, that the fire stopping around those is also important because these are primarily for, for compartmentation to stop the HVAC system or the, the smoke control system being aware that fire can get from one compartment to another. Other things to, to think about from a, a fire resistance point of view, uh, sandwich panels, you know, let's bear in mind that a lot of these sandwich panels use a, a, um, a non, uh, sorry, a flammable core, a, a combustible core. And in that case, what's the core material? What's the, any competent repairs? If there's been any repairs, were they done competently? Because we need to keep that, that core material uh, protected and keep it, those sorts of panels away from heating appliances, ovens, and don't use them in areas where highly combustible materials are going to be stored. Okay. So there's all, again, there's, if you, we've got those on the building, then there's an awful lot of requirements for records to be kept and processes and maintenance, et cetera, to be supervised. Coming soon, as we've already mentioned, uh, external wall systems will soon become common parts. So, and we've already got the, the ban on new uh, combustible materials on the high risk residential buildings. Um, you know, and the key questions are what's the core of the cladding, what's the insulation, what's the cavity barriers, uh, and how has the fire performance of that whole external wall system been justified? Has it been done by a system test, 8414 and the like? Has it been done by a desktop study, or has it been done by another method? In, finger in the air and hoping that it'll go away. So, so you know, there's there's a whole series of, of questions to, that will be coming forwards and that will be a, an area of, of concern. I'm sure a lot of discussion over the, as it's going to be over the coming months. But again, key thing in all of these is records that we've got going forwards. In terms of other passive fire protection, um, you know, if we're doing risk assessments, it's, it's review it where visible um, and is it in good condition? Is it complete? Uh, that which you will get for um, structural, you know, structural frame. What about the cavity barrier? Is it where, where you know, in, in terms of extensive cavities, is it visible, et cetera? And can you see it? What, and of course, what the records that are there helps all this going forwards. Um, I, point you in the general direction for structural frame of the fact that there are a number of technical guidance documents again that cover on-site uh, installation and inspection of these things. Um, 11 for reactive coating supplied on-site, 14 for structural PFP boarding systems, 15 for non-reactive coatings and 16 for off-site application of reactive coatings. And they all contain site inspection methodologies, performer checklists, for instance, which again, if you've got all those, and, and sorry, and those inspection methodologies are subtly different for each of those systems. Do that, get that right, get those records, hold those records. And therefore, when, you, when it comes to negotiating with your enforcement authorities, you've got that going forwards. Right, in terms of, of fire risk assessment, we've got published a, a, a guidebook. This is on the screen and I'm holding a copy of it here, little A5 guide. Um, and it's really, re this is a really, really useful guide. We need to update it. It needs a bit of updating that's planned for some point next year um, as the, we're waiting for the regulatory position to change. But uh, it, 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 there's stuff introducing um, the role of fire risk assessor and assessment, what PFP you need to associate, uh, inspect associated with means of escape, um, and what you need to do. It's obviously, it's not a full survey of a compliance with all the statutory documents and advisory documents, but what there is, is a bit of information on each of the types of passive fire protection, what to look for, both good and bad, as we've been through in this presentation, and some annexes with a bit more information and further reading and links to third party organizations. And all importantly, a checklist for each type of construction going forwards. Uh, and that's related to, which is related to means of escape. Okay. References to clauses in documents with further information. 
Right, and that brings me to the end of that. Boom, boom. Um, final, final point out. Uh, passive fire protection, you only need to use it once to ensure it works. So uh, our, from an SFP standpoint, we turn around to you and say, use third party certified products, use third party certified installer, in inspect them using the protocols in the ASFP technical guidance documents, keep, keep your records covering all the above. And that will get you, hopefully, you know, if, if you ever have a, a fire incident, you'll keep it contained like happened in that picture there. OK, that gets me to the end of that. I've got five minutes or so left um, for a few Q&A. And we've got six questions on the, the, the Q&A list at the moment. Seven, he says. Um, OK. Um, does the so the first question is does the external wall system also deal with rainwater drainage, plastic windows, soil pipes, etc.? Um, I'm I, I'll be honest, I'm not sure what's happening with with external wall systems and EWS ones at that moment in time, and how that will interfere in, interface into regulatory reform, fire safety order. I think there's an awful lot of that still to be to be worked out, but I will go and look that one up and get back to you if I can find any any answer on that one. OK, um, the next question is, how does the health and safety document relate to PAS 79? Um, and PAS 79, it covers what is required under the fire risk assessments, which is the stuff being done under regulatory reform order. Uh, the HSE document and the safety cases will go beyond that, and they will be they will be information that will be required for um, high risk residential buildings that come into scope of that new regulatory regime at post Hackett. Okay, and so the HSE document will will be for that, whereas the PAS seventy nine applies everywhere, um, wherever our, our FSO does. To satisfy construction products regulations, do products need to be tested to either national or harmonized standards or a standard approved by central government? Um, it depends how you're going to do this and whether you're, whether, whether you're following the prescriptive route uh, such as, a, as identified within ADB or whether you're using, um, whether you're using um, the, um, a, a sort of a design led basis. Um, so do pro it's so in effect, uh, if, if a pro sorry, if a product is subject to a harmonized standard, it should be tested to that harmonized standard or a, that's a, a European term. Nowadays we'd say designated standard, but that's no. Um, uh, if you're using ADB, then, then ADB tells you what standards to test to as national or, or whatever. Um, and if you're using a, a, a design approach, then you can you can work on that according. You can go for that accordingly and pick something. Um, is there a recognized is there a recognized course and qualification that demonstrates an inspector has an appropriate knowledge to evaluate all types of passive fire protection installations? If not, there should be. Certainly, inspection courses is something we're looking to develop going forwards. Um, it's certainly an area we recognize. I mean, we have, there is the, the um, ASFP training that we will mention in about two slides when we get to the wrap, um, and that will give you the knowledge of that, but it's the knowledge of what they are and how they work, and not necessarily all of the insp in inspection, it's not practical inspection training. Okay, and that, will, that second will hopefully be coming soon. And in terms of the fire risk assessment, do you think there is a need for what is expected by the FRS audit? Yes, I'm sure there is. I'm sure there is. Okay. Um, he says, I'll do, I'll do a couple more questions because that, but I'll do a couple more questions. Um, he says, in the, and, and there you go. Um, so should every item of PFP be logged into the fire strategy drawing and included in the regulation 38 document? Um, I, I, in effect, I would say at this stage, yes, it should. But obviously, um, but he said, but, but from a, then from a fire risk assessor's point of view, they would only be interested necessarily in 
the uh, stuff that's going on in and around escape routes? And will BS476 be phased out? And what will the impact be on existing buildings? Um, that's a really interesting question and one that could be the subject of a, of, of a lengthy webinar on its own. At the moment, the government's direction of travel is away from BS476 to the newer BSEN standards. Uh, ultimately, BS476 may be phased out, but in terms of the impact on existing buildings, if you've got your existing building is there and it's correct and it was done and using, four, using 476 tested uh, systems at the time when 476 was, was allowed, then, um, then there's uh, no reason why those 476 tested systems should remain fire resistant going forwards. Um, he says, I'm conscious of the fact that it's now one o'clock and there are, he said, what's happened is there's a, a load of questions, there's a few questions just arrived and there's a couple of three questions appeared in the um, chat as well. What we'll try and do is we'll try and do what we, we normally do. We'll get all those questions together. Hopefully, George can, Georgina in the office can, can pull them together and I'll have a go at and answering them and plonking them. Because what we will do, um, what we will now do is we will make the presentation. We've recorded it as we've done. And so the presentation that we've recorded will be loaded onto the ASFP website. And you can be able to access that as, again as, at, at your uh, leisure and have if you want to have a look at something again have a look at that or if you want to have a look at some of the slides again then please you know do that and and, and feel free and we'll try and have a get the, the questions um we'll, we'll try and get the questions answered as well as we go through okay so i'll just there's just a couple of three slides um to say at the end of the thing just to say um thanks very much for listening everybody uh, if you want to come and see us and meet us per se, um, we did a fire safety event a couple of three weeks ago at the NEC in Birmingham, and we're next. We're out live again, seventeenth uh, and eighteenth of November at London Build. Um, and if you're interested in that, have a there's a there's a website there, London Build Expo. So we're going down to London for that. I'll be there on the seventeenth. Um, we've got our awards lunch taking place in uh, November in Manchester. And uh, we're in, uh, inviting everyone to, there are a series of award nom awards that we will, um, we will present. Uh, you can, there's still time to nominate people or projects for the ASFP awards. So um, have a look at that. The closing date for award nominations is the end of this month. So you've got another week, just over a week to get your award nominations in and then we have got our our training courses um in terms of our classroom training and our e-learning for ife the ife level two and level three in passive fire protection they're up and running those are uh, two dates for a, a level three two sessions for a level three course one in derby and one in watford and if you want to read more about the classroom training that we have on passive fire protection um, in terms of its its use, its function, how it's designed and installed, um, and there's, there's some bits and pieces in there, um, then uh, please crash on, um, have a look at the ASFP training website, as you see there, and hopefully we'll, that's you know something you can have a look at. And then beyond that, um, I think, so, Sometimes if you stay online, there's a, a post webinar question to say what we can and can't do better. Otherwise, we'll maybe see you next time on the 13th of October for a session on PFP in modern methods of construction. Thanks for listening and staying on. Uh, hopefully see you soon.